Welcome to City Church. We are a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus, grow together, and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. You know, if you've been a part of City for the past year and a half, you know that last year we took an entire year to look at one thing in Scripture, and that was the kingdom of God. This year we're taking an entire year to look at the Sermon on the Mount, which explains what it means to live in the kingdom of God. And now, in the middle of the, I, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus brings us his prayer, the church's prayer, the kingdom prayer. And that's known as the Lord's Prayer. So if you're seated, please stand with us. We're gonna pray the Lord's Prayer together, and then you can be seated. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in Charlottesville as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. You may be seated. What's interesting to note is that throughout the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is assuming that we are going to be living in community. And so much of what Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer moves up and through the idea of community in his vision for a kingdom where people live very differently than the people who live in the kingdoms of this world. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a look at Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we're going to hit on a topic that may at the beginning seems maybe not applicable to our lives. We're gonna read from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, verses 33 through 37, and we're gonna deal with oaths, oaths. Here's what Jesus teaches. Again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. By the way, in Greek, oath and vow, same word. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. That was by, uh, pretty clear, that was before hair dye <laughs> ever hit the markets. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Interesting. What I want to do this morning is take a look at the Sermon on the Mount and to lay, take a look at the idea of oaths or vows and how does that apply to us today. First question, oath vow. Let's begin with oath. In what context, I'd like a little feedback, is oath used the most? Court, thank you. Some attorneys sitting here, no doubt. And uh, by the way, a quick aside, a good friend of mine was a judge here in Charlottesville, and he said that he would bang the gavel and say, let the lying begin, just <laughs> as an aside. But in our court system, we have what's called an oath. You put your hand on a Bible and you swear an oath. I've done that. I've had to testify in court before. Put my hand on a Bible, swore an oath. What about vows? What institution is vow a part of? Marriage. Marriage. There you go. Um, many years ago, my wife and I had, we made a vow before the Lord and for the people that were present in the sanctuary. You know, it's interesting to note that when you think about oath and vow, same word in Greek, it's interesting to note that Jesus begins to teach on the idea of vow and how we're to handle them in his kingdom immediately after he teaches on lust and divorce. It's interesting. By the way, if you were not here last week, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to go le uh, back and listen to Pastor Keith's sermon from last week. It was phenomenal. Pastor Keith dealt with lust and divorce. 
And what did Jesus actually teach? And what did he mean in the Sermon on the Mount when he dealt with that? The reality of it is God knows and Jesus knows that so goes the relationships of our lives, so goes culture. And so Jesus teaches at the very beginning of his sermon about the idea of lust and divorce. And now he's dealing with oaths and vows. So when we look at the text, what we discover is Jesus begins to teach on oath and vows immediately after he teaches on divorce. What Jesus is doing as he casts a vision for a new people in the Sermon on the Mount is he is building a very logical case and teaching for how he calls his kingdom people to live. What is an oath? What does the Greek word mean? Oath in Greek literally means a fence, a limit, a sacred restraint. If you would remember when Jesus, when I just read it earlier, Jesus says, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Do not break your oath is literally one Greek word, and it means to swear falsely or commit perjury. The question would be is, where did the idea of oaths and vows come from? They're extremely biblical. You see, when Moses was setting up God's people, the people of Israel, and was receiving the law of God, God said to Moses and to the people of Israel in Leviticus chapter 19, I just want you to listen, as God brings laws to his people so that they will live like very differently than the people around them. Here's what God says, Levit Leviticus 19.9 and a few verses following. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. By the way, God built into the fabric of his people a social welfare system where people knew if they came by a Jewish person's field, there would always be food. Isn't that interesting? He says, I am the Lord your God. And then God goes on to say, immediately after that, do not steal. Stealing destroys culture. Do not lie. That does the same thing. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the Lord, the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You see, Using the Lord's name in vain is something that was very common at the time of Jesus. You see, at the time of Jesus, we have extra biblical record of this where there was a tradition where religious people would make oaths and vows to each other very flippantly. And the way that you would do that is you would swear by the temple. I'm gonna swear by the temple. But there was sort of a hierarchy to what you would swear to. So let's say one of the students here up front, I swore an oath to him by the temple, and then I decided to retract that. I would make a new oath that was based upon the gold in the temple, therefore negating this one. And it had become a culture where people were kind of calling on godly things to reinforce themselves instead of simply standing square in the middle as Jesus calls us to and letting our yes be yes and our no be no. What you would discover very quickly is that if you did a word study with the word oath in Matthew's gospel, which is the accurate way to do it, Jesus begins here talking about oath and vow. If you follow that word through the Gospel of Matthew, you will discover something that is extremely insightful. What I want to do now is mention to us or read for us the two episodes where after Jesus delivers the Sermon on the Mount, people still are involved with oaths. I want us to catch this. The first one is the beheading of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. I just want to read for us the story. It says that the, at that time, King Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. 
That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. So what we have is we've got King Herod, the king of Israel. He's the king. And when he hears about Jesus, he goes, oh no, I think John the Baptist came back to life. That's who Jesus is. Now let's read on the rest of the story of his beheading of John the Baptist. It said, now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now let's just picture where we're headed here. The king of Israel, Herod, is having an illicit affair with his brother Philip's wife. And John the Baptist, who's the last of the Older Testament prophets, does what prophets do. They get in the face of the king and they point their bony prophetic finger and say, you can't do that. Let's read on. It says that Herod then arrested John. It's amazing. Now Herod arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And Herod wanted to kill John. But he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet, which he was. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guest and pleased Herod so much that he promised with Anne an oath to give her whatever she asked. By the way, the Gospel of Luke says he promised her up to half of his kingdom with an oath. Interesting. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. Now let me just paint for you the picture of what just happened. Have you ever seen a dysfunctional family? This is the height of dysfunction. I want you to just picture this. You've got the king who's having an affair with his brother Philip's wife. By the way, when Herod the Great died, he divided his kingdom into three chunks. Philip got a chunk, and this Herod got a chunk as well. So he's having an illicit affair with his brother's wife. John the Baptist goes in and goes, up. Oh, this is one of the big ten. Don't commit adultery, and he's the prophet. And so what does Herod do? Puts him in prison. Now I want you to picture how the dysfunction grows. The story tells us that you've got this woman by the name of Herodias, and she has her daughter do an illicit dance at Herod's birthday party. Do you smell any dysfunction here? None whatsoever, right? It's unbelievable. And then picture the young girl goes to her mom and says, that guy just offered me half the kingdom. And Herodias goes, I heard it. I heard it. By the way, Josephus tells us the daughter's name is Salome. Salome goes to Herodias. He just offered me half the kingdom. She's really excited. And Herodias is smart. She doesn't want half the kingdom. She wants it all. She got to kill the voice of God. So she tells her little, most likely, pre-adolescent daughter to go to the king. Say, give me, the, give me the head of John. And then we just read what happens. The head is brought in and given to her. And she gives it to her mother. That's what you call familial dysfunction at its apex. Now, what we have in the middle of all this dysfunction is you have Herod the king who makes an oath and then he regrets it. But notice, even as king with all of his power, he could not undo the oath. All right, let's pick up the next one. The next story is where an oath is made where Peter, the apostle, disowns Jesus. 
Later in the book of Matthew, we pick up the final announcement of an oath. It says, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard just in context. Peter, as Jesus' disciple, had been told by Jesus, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter turns to Jesus and says, Peter, that will never, ever, ever happen. Even if these other 11 deny you, I never will. And Peter go, or Jesus goes to Peter, sorry, man, you're going to. Now we pick up the reading where that happens. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. Jesus is arrested. He's in the courtyard. And it says, and a servant girl came to Peter and said, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about. And then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said, said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus the Nazareth. He denied it again with an, an oath. So somehow he invokes the name of God and says, Never met him. Don't know who Jesus is. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. He had a Galilean accent. And then he began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I don't know the man. You see, an oath is based upon the fact that I enter into some agreement and if I don't follow it through, then God will judge me. A vow is when I step into an agreement, and if I don't fulfill it, then God will judge me. So now Peter has made an oath, and the third time someone comes to him, and he goes, okay, God, judge me. If I knew him, strike me dead. He calls down curses. Reading on, it says, immediately a rooster crowed, and then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. By the way, Luke chapter 22, verse 61 says, at that moment, Jesus turns and he looks right at Peter and their eyes meet. An oath. How do we put feet to our faith with this? James chapter five echoes what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. As I was studying oaths, I came across this writing by one of my favorite theologians. And here's what he wrote about oaths. Because oaths were supposed to be part of the kingdom of God and the family of God, but for only specific things. And so this theologian wrote, and I found it very fascinating and personally convicting. He wrote, if God's oaths reveal that humans are accustomed to hearing lies, then oaths, vows, and promises reveal that we are also accustomed to telling lies. We swear and promise because we are careless at best. This is what convicted me. If a child asks a parent for a promise, the parent should hear it as an indictment since it reveals that the child has learned he cannot trust his father's words. His yes has not always meant yes and his no has not always meant no. Ideally, a parent's word should be so reliable that the ch child never thinks of guarantees. Indeed, every disciple should aim to be so reliable that no one asks for him for promises. The idea here is, is that Jesus knows that the way the kingdom must thrive is in his kingdom, there will be a group of people that let their yes be yes, and their no be no. And they don't have to say, I swear to God or I swear on my mother's grave that I will stand there in raw authenticity and let my yes be yes and my no be no. October 21st, 1990, I stood in an altar and made a vow to my wife, Fran. 
That's what vows are for. Vows are when we step into a relational reality and we make a commitment before a group of people and before God that we're going to step into this relationship and there will be solidarity in that relationship. The honest truth is, is when I stood at that altar, there were a lot of things I didn't know about Fran. A lot. But after 33 years, if you did the math, after 33 years, I have found that in that type of a vow, God is incredibly faithful. I took an oath. I took a vow. And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that because that vow was in God's will and it was positive and it was called by God, he has empowered us to live this out. But you know, the reality of it is the two examples of vows that are given in the, in the gospel of Matthew are negative They're negative vows. We look at King Herod's, his vow is made in a negative dysfunctional context. And if you look at the apostle Peter, he makes a vow in a negative dysfunctional context. Both of them made vows out of dysfunction. And this is where I want us to settle in before we close. For some of you, you will have no idea what I'm talking about. And I pray to God that that's true. But for others of us, you will know about the vows and the oaths you have taken that have been out of brokenness and dysfunction and pain. And those don't ever end well. They don't. Let me give you two examples. I remember in my pastoral years, sitting with a man And when I sat with him, here's what he told me. He said, when I was a young man, my heart got hurt in a romantic relationship and I made a vow that day I would never be hurt again. He had been married for decades and never opened his heart. And the dysfunction and the brokenness that his vow that was made in dysfunction and pain and brokenness rippled through his family. Another one was talking to a gentleman who was in senior of years, very, very wealthy. But he told me how as a young boy in a poor family, he made a vow, he made an oath to himself out of embarrassment and pain that he would never, ever ever be poor. He had spent his entire life chasing money and had amassed a bunch of it, but there was a wake of ruined relationships in his path. You see, when we make oaths that are out of dysfunction and pain, the way Peter did and the way King Herod did, it wreaks havoc. And my question is, have you ever done that? Have you ever said in the context of a relationship, I will never forgive again? Have you ever made an oath to yourself, through yourself, without God in the picture, and said, here is how I'm going to live, and here's what I'm going to do? That is what Jesus is speaking about on the Sermon on the Mount. And I've watched people who have made oaths And they've lived through them. And they've wreaked havoc on their life. Because oaths and vows made out of dysfunction and pain perpetuate that. Oaths and vows that are made in the center of God's will. And the beauty of trusting him brings transformation in the kingdom. Will you stand with me as we close? As we stand together... Would you take just a moment to close your eyes in God's presence? And if you're comfortable, lift your hands up in front of you. In the present working of God's Spirit, would God bring something to mind of an oath that you made? A vow that you made to yourself, through yourself. 
It was based out of suffering or pain or dysfunction or brokenness. It didn't include God. If that's you, I would ask that whether you're young or old, that you would bring that to Jesus. That you would confess and repent and ask Jesus to take that. And then step towards him in trust and open heart heartedness so that the Spirit of God can do the work that needs to be done in your heart and in your soul. Before the worship team leads us, can we just take a moment in God's presence to allow the Spirit to convict us and to strengthen us and to transform us into kingdom people.